Well, I think part of my fascination with uh, Omakosum is that uh, I think for the longest time my work has been focused around women, um, but mainly about my inspiration of very strong uh, women artists um, from the I Iranian culture and now the Middle East. Uh, women that haven't just produced fantastic work of literature or uh, like Women Without Men was written by Sharnush Parsipur um, and uh, Furugh Farahsad, another poet who I really loved, but women who also have lived very interesting and challenging lives. Um, and I think uh, intuitively I'm drawn to this woman because I find that as an artist I live a very challenging life and I'm trying to always balance uh, the, the creative process and my devotion to my work and my personal existence. Um, a lot of it to do with the, the socio-political issues. For example, how woman uh, Sharnush Parsipur was in prison and she was mentally ill and she was institutionalized with, uh, you know, uh, with Furugh and other story that you may not know her so well. Uh, I think with Omokosum is um, a kind of a phenomena of an artist that became the most important artist of the 20th century. Um, and it was a woman, uh, it was a non-traditional woman, it was not a beautiful woman. And she, unlike many iconic Western female singers, never had a dip, and never had a tragic ending. Uh, she succeeded until she died. Um, and, and that she was loved by the Sunnis, the Shia, the, the secular, the non-secular, the Jews, the, the Muslims, the men, women, rich, poor. And so the, the essential quality about who she was and the achievements in her life uh, was a absolute curiosity to me and I think it is to many people as a woman in a totally male dominated society. So I think my obsession with her sort of goes back to my obsession to many other iconic women artists in the Middle East and trying to go under the skin of them and then trying to frame some of my own questions I think as a woman artist. <laughs> I'm very fascinated by the seductiveness of certain women artists who, um, who regardless of their very difficult um, lives and situation and being um, sort of up against the wall as women in a male-dominated society, they have an ability to seduce such a large audience. And I think in her um, example, uh, I mean, really I think it's unprecedented as a as the person she was that she was not really beautiful and yet she was able to move millions of people to tears uh, in their emotions she almost created an orgasmic quality experience for her audience in a way the way that she used her voice um, and that so she was an absolute um, in control of her audience by creating this experience of ecstasy yet no one could guess who she was um, and, and that she shielded all her own personal emotion and personal life. And it was said that she worked all her life to remain an image, you know, and she constructed this, uh, her own legacy that so after she dies, she would be remembered this way, no other way. It's, it's really unusual because us as artists, we are known to be mad and, and vulnerable and, and insecure and egotistic and she was egotistic but, but she never allowed her vulnerability to be exposed to her audience. Uh, she only controlled with their, their vulnerability which I find fascinating uh, as an artist who myself deal with my own vulnerabilities and I think that's what the film was about. 
because you know we have a filmmaker who's Iranian, who's a little bit modeled based on me, who's dealing with her own challenges and personal life and her own creative passion, and is looking up to her as someone who was indestructible. It was like so stoic and so like a rock, and 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 she really believed that's how a woman should be, like great, you know, like to be super strong. But then when life brought issues to her and she started to break down, uh, she realized that she's really very human. She's not a mythical character like Omikosum. Then so how do you balance then as a woman, uh, you know, this idea of the feeling of guilt that she had about her son, etc. So it's really uh, at the end the film was using Omikosum in a way of exploring the experience and uh, of being a woman artist, the price that many women have to pay in order to pursue uh, what is their passion. And I don't think it's exclusive to Middle Eastern women. I think it's very much also a Western issue. Um, but I used that example of, of Omokosum. Your name? Reda. Reda Shrif. You speak English? A little bit. So, let's start with you singing one of your favorite Uncle Sum songs, and then we'll have you read some lines. Yes, uh, so I, I, I thought for me uh, it was very interesting to have three women characters in this film. First was Omakosum, who was the icon. Then it was these two women. One, uh, Mitra, this director who is absolutely ambitious and begins the film as a biopic and he really, she really thinks that she's making a film to show how heroic Omakosum is and how indestructible she is. And in order to succeed, she had to turn her back to her family, you know, to everything that she, she loves. And yet there's a young woman who, who, as young as she is and as gifted as she is, she has no interest in ambition and building a career. And, and she's very humble. And so we felt that by creating this triangle, we have the various extreme uh, characters. And that at the end when Mitra has a breakdown, it's actually this young woman who comes back and says, don't you for, uh, remember that you told me in order to be great, you have to turn your back to your family. So why are you grieving so much? And so I wanted to show how, of course, not every woman lives with that dream of becoming successful, um, but yet uh, we have the right to dream. And, and, and so that was Mitra's obsession with, I want to be like Omekosum, to be great. And that means that I can excuse myself of failing to be a great mother, failing to be a responsible uh, wife or whatever, and, and having political issues. Most important is my work. And then at some point when things go wrong, she realizes that she really can't turn a blind eye to reality because at the end she's a human being. So then she wonders, well, how did she do it? How did Omakosum do it? Did she ever suffer? Did she ever fail? And then she tries to bring her down, you see. Uh, where with um, Gada, this other young Egyptian woman, she was consistently how she really felt that, yes, I have a good voice, but I really don't want to be famous. I don't want to succeed. So I thought that was a really important counterpoint to the story to show the extreme other opposites. <laughs> Let's go quickly for another one, please. But, Mitra, I can't. I'm losing my voice. I know, Gara. This would be the last one, I promise. 
لا تفقه أي شيء في أم كلثوم. هي مش عارفة إن أنا بغني بقالي ست ساعات وصوتي راح بجد. لما هو كده إيه اللي جابك طيب؟ هات العيش مر. بس أنا حاسة إن هي فاهمة هي بتعمل إيه. أحمد باك تو وان. يلا في الإعادة يا فادة. تكرار بعلم الحمار ايش شطار yes i i mean i i thought um uh, it, it was really interesting to focus on um how both oma kursum related to her environment that was always being surrounded by men you know and 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 then mitra always, uh, you know, being surrounded by men uh, of her own in, like, contemporary time, because Mitra's time was now. Um, and, and that the, the character of Latif, who was a critic, who was both a fan of Oma Kursum, who, if you remember at the beginning when she had a panic attack, he got up and said, Oma Kursum, sing for us. We have been all the, here because of you. But later, he did a caricature of her and made fun of her, saying that, um, you know, Oma Kursum sings for the poor king, something like that, and made her furious. And she asked him to come, and then she asked him to write her songs, and he rejected her. So, you know, he was very cruel to her. And this is based on a real character that we met and interviewed. But then in the story of Mitra, that same actor becomes a nuisance and he's always giving her a hard time. Oh, you don't speak Arabic and you don't know Oma Kursum. But the, the reality is in the actual production, that, that actor was Palestinian. <laughs> he was very difficult with me. <laughs> so it was like the triple of the, <laughs> because he wouldn't take directions. He was very self-centered. He was an interesting guy, but uh, it was really interesting because he never followed my directions and he would always explode. And I thought, that is so fascinating that we have me with this guy have, and the same character playing two other roles and he's giving hard time to Omoko Sum, to Mitra and now to me. So I think what I try to put into Mitra's character, of course, you know, it's a more exaggerated because it's a film, but it's really um, my experience as an Iranian uh, working on an Arabic narrative and not speaking Arabic, but generally working as a woman film director uh, surrounded by men and how you keep a sense of authority and control and that you don't compromise your ideas but yet are respectful to the men and how you become desexualized in, in a way that you become like a man and someone mentioned yesterday that throughout this whole film, what's missing is sexuality. Because I think also Oma Kursum, as a woman who he really dominated her orchestra and her collaborators, she became desexualized in a way that she had to be like a man in order to be in control, which I think it happens to a lot of women who become powerful. Uh, they feel like they, they become like very masculinized. And I think in many ways, um, I feel like a lot of time, although I feel very feminine, I have to act like a man in order to, for people to take me seriously. And, and ironically though, I am surrounded by men. So I think this is something I wanted to bring out into the film. And uh, another ironic, uh, ironic thing was, for example, the ending of the film, where she wanted to change the ending. Uh, the producers said no. And in my own actual film, the producers came at the end and said to me, we really think that you're ending the film in the wrong note. Can you reconsider? And I said, no, absolutely not. So I actually became the victorious one. But a lot of things that you saw in this film mimics reality. My interpretation is because obviously I speak as an artist, but I'm very interested in history and 
spent a lot of time studying Iran in the 50s because of Women Without Men. And with this film, I really studied modern history of Egypt. And there's a lot of parallels. Um, the transformation of the country from monarchy to then uh, in Egypt, you had the social revolution in 1952. And in Iran, you had the Islamic revolution in 1979. And, and, and I think what happens is transformation of uh, you know, the, the monarchy that allowed a lot of uh, European intervention and westernization of the country that in some ways it intervened with the more authentic nature of the country but at the same time uh, it sort of uh, created some kind of, not democracy, but some kind of freedom that was, uh, uh, at least in my generation when I grew up, uh, was, uh, it, it was very much appreciated. Uh, the, the later Islamic Islamization of the country in our culture and later uh, I think even with Nasser that people often compared with communism in a way that it became very restri strict and and it really controlled uh, the wealth and, and 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 various ideologies that became uh, very politicized you know and people became very divided in Iran um, immediately after the Islamic Revolution um, we felt extremely oppressed and 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 you know, Islam is uh, is a religion that we adapted to after the Arab invasion. So, uh, and we made it into something that was not a force, but something that we liked. And suddenly, uh, with the new regime came uh, a very totalitarian um, regime that really forced certain things on people that was not in their nature, not in the Persian tradition. And so I think people in really deeply suffered uh, from the identity crisis, uh, from Persian to now Muslims, to fanaticism, to their image into the world, uh, a very terrible image. And, and so they felt um, both um, disjointed inside of their country because they were under pressure, but isolated in the world. And I think with the Egyptians, um, they've gone through a lot of identity crisis. And I think uh, Nasser in some way brought a lot of hope because uh, they did feel like the British really controlled too much of them, like in, in Iran. Uh, the British dominated the oil and then we had the coup d'etat by the CIA, etc. But then when Nasser came, they felt also betrayed because they were badly defeated by the Israel. And then came Obarak and then came the, the revolution. So they, they felt, I think, in many ways betrayed by one dictator after another. But when you really look back, it's been a long time since both the Egyptian and Iranian cultures where they felt some form of freedom. Uh, some, I mean, today in Egypt, there is no freedom of expression with CC, And I hear from my colleagues and, and in Iran, absolutely not. So when you compare it to even during the Shah period, it was so much better, not that I support the Shah. So I think on the, there's been very unfortunate and tragic historical events that it cannot be erased and has um, brought the culture into a very bad point. That's why I think it's important to make films to reflect on periods that were really cosmopolitan, very sophisticated, and even a woman could be a leading uh, artist um, of the 20th century. And yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the, the idea of paradoxical and 
contrasts and contradictions and opposites. Um, I think it's the core of my own thinking about life, you know, as someone who's bicultural, who, you know, is Iranian but is very Western, and, and my work is very personal but it's deeply engaged in social political issues. And, and for example, the example of Momo Kosum making a film that is about music, but it's so much about the political reality, about historical reality, about people of power and, and her interaction with those people, like we showed very clearly with Nasser and then with King Farouk. And, and so how, um, you know, um, individual lives intersect um, political realities and how they affect us, um, their work, their, our, our mindsets. And, and so in that way, I think my own personal life has been defined by political reality. I mean, the Islamic revolution, now life in exile. And so it's, it's almost impossible to think about just purely emotional, aesthetic issues or more existential issues without a counterpoint of sociopolitical realities or even religious issues. Um, so it's just not in my capability to, to think only one way. And I also see the good and evil at the same time. Like for example, a lot of people say, oh, your, your images are so beautiful. I said, but never uh, without um, a, a disturbance of something very dark and horror um, uh, and painful. Uh, I think m my images are extremely melancholic while very beautiful. And I think that's a kind of a poetic nature of Iranian people. Uh, I mean, if, for example, I keep referring to that image of woman without men, of this anorexic woman in a bathhouse where there's this magnificent Orientalist um, bathhouse that could belong to a painting, yet she's bleeding and she's anorexic. Or um, some of these images, like this grand concert hall and the woman is losing her voice. And uh, there, there's this constant reminder of very painful uh, experiences um, you know, at the same time that we're in a very beautiful setting. Um, and I think that's how I feel as a, as a human being, that I'm very, very conscious of my fragility, my insecurity, my ego, the very painful separation from the family and sense of abandonment and, and the strength and yet complete weakness. And, 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 and that is how I feel like always inundated by f like myself, an embodiment of contradictions. And so my characters as people and my narratives sort of embody that, that kind of duality that I feel deeply inside. I'm so fascinated by women, I mean, being more specific about Iranian women. Just to give you an example, the last few months, the country of Iran, the government has been extremely coming down harsh on the people because of recent uprisings by the workers and worker class. And, and then the uh, women suddenly like just surprised everyone. Suddenly they would just show up all over the country, stand up on them somewhere high and take off their way and hold it like this. And there's just not enough police to arrest this woman. And then I just posted something on Instagram that I found that, you know, two women are walking down the street, the guy is playing music and trying to collect some money. And this woman just started dancing, dancing like really, like intensely dancing. And then the scarf falls down and the police comes and they keep dancing and dancing. Like this, this kind of, um, this attitude of protest is so, you know, and fearlessness and, and defiance is something so profoundly inside of every woman in Iran because I think in nature when you're so up against the wall, um, up against the wall, like unlike the men, your tendency is to revolt, you know? And I know myself that I, I get that way. And where with the men, I think they're less against the wall, so they seem to be a little bit less um, confrontational. But with the woman of Iran is like the biggest threat to the government. And I always say that if anyone is going to overthrow the current government, is the Iranian woman. And, and so that is a kind of example of, uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm not a feminist, but I take a lot of pride in the examples of women who are, who again, uh, don't deny the oppression and the repressive nature of the government, 
but they have never accepted, they've never been submissive to the rules. They're always fighting against it. And this is, this is a complete misperception from the Western perspective. They all think that, oh, all these wo Muslim women are victims and, you know, very passive. It's extremely opposite. And I take a lot of pride in that. Well, uh, I can speak uh, for my own country. Um, you know, we are following very closely, particularly the last few months, um, where th we've had this again another movement, which. I, I, it's not really reported very much in the West, which is really interesting. Uh, I, I, again, the media it, it sort of covers things in, in the way that comes as a wave, you know, and just brief, and then uh, they lose interest. And I mean, the uprising we had in Iran uh, in December and January uh, were almost turning into a revolution and was the strongest upheaval we had since the Green Movement in 2009 but it was badly um, defeated by the government's very, very atrocious and harsh uh, backlash, um, arresting people, killing people, and um, there's been very, very criminal behavior again uh, of the government, killing very innocent env environmentalists, very dear friends of mine. Their father was just killed. They said, oh, he committed suicide. Uh, and so we are, as Iranians, uh, inundated with terrible uh, events that are taking place, but it doesn't get reported anymore because it's not so newsworthy. Uh, and I, I hear more and more even last night from Danish people saying, I just went to Iran, it's a fantastic country, the best trip I've ever had, the hospitality, but they have no knowledge of what goes on really internally in Iran. The economic uh, economy has collapsed, uh, the people are suffering uh, from unemployment, uh, there's a huge sense of hierarchy, the rich are super rich, the poor are extremely poor, the middle class is not caring anymore uh, because they, they don't want to pour on the street anymore because they're afraid of being arrested. Me meanwhile, the, the working class is up to here. So we really see that this government is on its last leg, but now that they realize that they're becoming even more violent and their human rights, uh, uh, the, the absolute um, disregard for human rights and, and the way that um, they are just um, doing genocide with, the, with their own citizens, really. But what does it take uh, for the next step? Uh, an Iranian, Omar Kazum, or Shirin well, Nishat? Th 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 well, this is the problem we're having uh, in Iran, that there is no clear alternative. And, 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 you know, we on the outside very often feel like we shouldn't even say anything because we're not in the inside. But a lot of the Iranian people inside say, we need your support. We need people who are outside because we in the inside cannot say anything because we will get killed. And so people like me as artists, uh, we're finding ourselves speaking out and, and, and really um, calling out uh, against this regime and for democracy. Um, no, I, I don't quite know, but I think people are up to here. And, and what the anxiety, I mean, it, I think the interpretation is different according to who you speak to. But the anxiety of some people is that we have no clear al alternative and that there has to be someone that comes like, from within the government, but we have already lost hope within the reformists. So then the question is, you know, who? I mean, I think we need uh, an idea of a savior, someone who brings hope. And, and a sense of unity, and we don't have that clear indication who could that be, and that is the, the saddest thing, I think. <laughs>
One of the gifts that, I mean, my life has been kind of difficult because the forced separation from family and feeling that I've grown up by myself. I never had a family since I was a young adult. So I had to care for myself and I've, I've seen a lot of battles that I've had to deal with in U.S. And, um, and you know, I, I do feel though at the same time that the struggles that I went through has made me who I am and I think that in the Western culture, I, I worry sometimes that, you know, um, the life that we're encouraged to have, it's a lot about individual ideas and interest and, and really our own self-interest uh, in, that it in, in some ways is worrisome because I think growing up in troubled uh, countries such as in the Middle East, uh, you tend to think beyond yourself, you think about um, a more community, you think about the bigger questions that is not just about you. Um, and unfortunately, and I'm coming from America where it is a very capitalistic and individualistic um, society, that we are told basically just look after ourselves. And, 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 and really, um, you know, if you have a problem, we go to a therapist, you know. I think it's so important for young people to think about the world, the bigger picture, and, and the more generous you are, the more kinder you are, the more compassionate you are to other people's issues, um, the more you love yourself and the more caring you are for your own family. I find it extremely dangerous when you are within a very limited boundary that uh, it, it really only leads to a very small and egotistic life that um, and in, in, in many ways I think very many people are happy just with that, to be well and the well-being of their own immediate family. But I think life could be more meaningful if we find the compassion to open our minds and our eyes to other people's issues and see if we can, if we can expand our love and, and care for people beyond our immediate family. I think that's the way I see it. And, and as an artist, I think, I'm lucky because it expands my world into, you know, an area that I don't just think about myself and I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm.